Good morning, I'm Kenneth Moten. And I'm Kimberly Brooks. Here are the top five things to know this Tuesday. Number one, the stage is set for a contentious battle over the ground rules in the historic impeachment trial. Republicans have unveiled a plan for a speedy trial. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell wants to give House impeachment managers 24 hours over two days to make their case against President Trump. And the president's attorneys will get equal time to respond. But the Senate's top Democrats slammed the proposal, saying key facts will be delivered in the middle of the night. Number two, the Iowa caucuses are less than two weeks away, and a new poll finds former Vice President Joe Biden leading the pack. But Biden could gain even more ground because three of his rival senators, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Amy Klobuchar, are being forced to return to Washington for the Senate impeachment trial. On to number three, anger is growing in Puerto Rico over management of emergency aid. Hundreds of protesters demonstrated outside the governor's mansion demanding Juan de Vasquez resign. This follows discovery of a government warehouse full of supplies that were supposed to go to earthquake victims. Vasquez has fired three officials and asked the Department of Justice to investigate. We head to California for number four, where officials were forced to close down a popular park after a mountain lion attacked a little boy. The big cat grabbed the three-year-old by the neck as he was walking with his family. Luckily, he was able to escape with only minor injuries after his quick-thinking father threw his backpack at the cat. The cougar was found in a tree with the bag still in its teeth. The mountain lion had to be euthanized, though, because it was considered a public safety threat. And finally, number five, a lesson for drivers. Don't leave your car window open during a blizzard like this woman in Newfoundland, Canada, did. She could barely get inside her car after the storm, and that snow won't be melting anytime soon with temperatures in the single digits. Got to get a hair dryer, <laughs> some towels, and work it out. We are back here on This Morning America, fresh from the MLK holiday. Great to have Kimberly Brooks here. Thank you. And let's get right to that big story, the impeachment showdown on Capitol Hill. Lawmakers are set to battle each other over the ground rules as President Trump's historic trial shifts into gear today. The top Republican in the Senate unveiled the rules for the trial overnight, giving each side 24 hours over two days to make their case. The Democrats claim Republicans are trying to rush the trial to avoid witnesses and bury facts. ABC's Elizabeth Hur has the new details from Washington. Good morning, Elizabeth. Kimberly and Kenneth, good morning. Yes, all along, Republicans have made it very clear they want this trial to be over very quickly. And now we know if this trial wraps without any witness testimonies, it is possible this is all over sometime next week. Ahead of the historic impeachment showdown, Democrats blasting Republicans. Senator McConnell's resolution is a national disgrace. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer Senate slamming Con Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's proposed resolution, which gives the two sides two days each, 24 hours in all, to make their opening arguments. Then there will be 16 hours of questions from senators. After that, the debate over the issue of witnesses. It's clear McConnell is hell-bent on making it much more difficult to get witnesses and documents and intent on rushing the trial through. This, as President Trump's lawyers argue in their 110-page brief, the process has violated every precedent and every principle of fairness. With one of the president's lawyers, Alan Dershowitz, claiming the articles of impeachment do not rise to the levels of high crimes and misdemeanors as the Constitution requires. But the articles of impeachment are two non-criminal uh, actions. But Dershowitz himself said the exact opposite 21 years ago during the Clinton impeachment. Certainly it doesn't have to be a crime if you have somebody who completely corrupts the office of president. And I've this was Dershowitz on CNN then. last night explaining his contradiction. So I've now then. done the research. No, I wasn't wrong. What I, I, have, I have a more sophisticated basis for my argument now, having read Justice uh, uh, Curtis's opinion and other opinions. And so this afternoon, Chief Justice John Roberts will gavel in the trial, and that's when those proposed rules will be laid out, which again, Democrats say they will fight, they say, to get a fair trial. Kenneth and Kimberly. All right, Elizabeth, thank you. ABC News will bring you live coverage of today's impeachment proceedings beginning around 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. A lot more news to get to this morning. Coming up, Ozzy Osbourne speaks out in an ABC News exclusive. What he's saying about his health and the rumors swirling after he was forced to cancel a tour right after this.
And welcome back. We've been up all night watching the latest news. Here's a look at some of the stories we've been tracking on World News Now in America this morning. A new lawsuit has been, has been filed against Jeffrey Epstein and one of his alleged co-conspirators. Yeah, in her civil suit, an unnamed plaintiff claims she was abused by Epstein as a young teenager. It also alleges that Ghislaine Maxwell regularly facilitated Epstein's abuse and was frequently present when it occurred. The suit also claims Epstein allegedly raped the plaintiff on multiple occasions in three states. We turn now to Florida and a major break in a cold case dating back to the 1980s. Back then, the so-called pillowcase rapist was terrorizing women up and down the coast, and now police have arrested a retired cable worker. Nearly four decades after a serial rapist terrorized South Florida, police say they found their man. From the moment I met him, he just, he just gave me the wrong, the wrong feeling. This morning, 60-year-old Robert Kohler is behind bars, accused of being the person behind the pillowcase in a string of cold case assaults. The so-called pillowcase rapist began his spree in 1981, attacking 45 women in just five years. The pattern went undetected until an investigative reporter noticed the similarities and notified investigators. His M.O. was to target young professional women, including nurses, teachers, and students. He would sneak in through an unlocked door or window, use a pillowcase or covering to obscure his face, hold them at knife point, and tie them up during the attacks. In one case, he allegedly returned to the scene of the crime weeks later, and before leaving undetected, wrote an obscene message on his victim's mirror that only appeared once steam from her shower made it visible. Only one of his victims ever caught a glimpse of her attacker and finally gave police a face to look for. Still, it would take another 30 years before officers descended on this Florida neighborhood in Palm Bay, arresting Kohler, who is a registered sex offender for an unrelated assault. Neighbors were stunned. We knew that he had a little bit of a, a, a checkered past. We had no idea of the rest of this. Police have not revealed what led them to Kohler, and he has not yet entered a plea. The pillowcase rapist abruptly stopped his crime spree in 1986. The task force assigned to the case disbanded the following year after his trail went cold. And turning overseas to a rocket attack dangerously close to the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, at least three rockets were fired from outside the city into the fortified green zone, but there were no reports of injuries or damage. And overnight, three people were killed as anti-government protesters clashed with Iraqi security forces firing tear gas and live rounds. A nightclub security guard is being credited with saving lives after a deadly shooting in Kansas City. Police say the guard fatally shot a man who had opened fire on a line of people waiting to enter the club. That followed a confrontation inside where fans were celebrating the Chiefs win Sunday. A woman was killed and 15 other people were injured. The motive remains unclear. Dramatic video from Charlotte, North Carolina, moments after a high school wrestler was penalized Whoa. during a match. His opponent's father charged out of the stands and knocked him to the floor. The man was wrestled to the ground by coaches and officials and charged by police for assault and disorderly conduct. Police in Texas are trying to track down a driver who shot and wounded a little girl during a road rage incident. The mother of nine-year-old Ruby Rhodes says she was driving on a Dallas highway with her daughter in the back seat when a man cut them off and nearly crashed into them. That's when he pulled up alongside them and opened fire. We, we made eye contact before, and the next thing I know, I heard pop, 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 pop. The doctor has told us several times that she's very lucky that she's alive. You should just really turn yourself in because that was just, my baby's life is, will never be the same. The girl was shot in the side and needed two surgeries. She's now in stable condition. New details in the wrongful death lawsuit filed by the family of music superstar Prince. The singer died of an accidental fentanyl overdose in 2016. Relatives sued a doctor and an Illinois hospital, among others, claiming substandard care contributed to his death. Reports say the suit was quietly dismissed in recent months, suggesting Prince's relatives reached a settlement. And a car crash may have ended the career of a well-known basketball player. Chandler Parsons of the Atlanta Hawks has reportedly suffered a traumatic brain injury in a three-car crash with an alleged drunk driver. His lawyers say Parsons suffered permanent damage and a herniated disc. The injuries could force him to retire. Time to check the polls. We begin with Ozzy Osbourne speaking out about his recent health struggles. 2019 was a rough year for him. During an exclusive interview with Robin Roberts, he calls it the most miserable year of his life. Osborne was forced to cancel a tour after he fell in his bathroom in October, and he says he's still recovering. I fell, and I, I just fell and landed. I like a slam on the floor. And I remember lying there thinking, well, he's done it now. 
really calm. I was trying to get an ambulance. After that, it was all down, yeah. downhill. Mm. Coming from a working class background, mm. I hate to let people down. I hate to not do my job. And so when I see my wife going to work, my kids going to work, everybody's doing it, trying to be helpful to me, that gets me down because I can't contribute to my family, you know. On this year's Martin Luther King Jr. Day, a first for an African-American, the U.S. Navy has honored sailor Doris Dory Miller, naming an aircraft carrier after him. Miller served as a ship's cook during the attack on Pearl Harbor, stepping up to help the wounded, then taking control of an anti-aircraft machine gun, despite the fact Jim Crow laws in the country banned him from carrying a weapon. Miller died in battle just two years later. As gestures of service and charity, both big and small played out across the nation, a group of elementary school students in Houston did their part to honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was an oratory competition, and this year's topic, what would Dr. King's vision be for America in 2020? Here's what they had to say. We must go back and review Dr. King's dream for all mankind. The greatness of a nation in the future depends on the visions and actions of its citizens in the present. America is seen by the world as a reference for what greatness should be. Dr. King once said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I believe the best of us comes out when we work collectively as a team. This does not mean we cannot disagree. As Dr. King taught us, we have to learn to disagree without being disagreeable. I don't believe that Dr. King would have imagined that this would be our America in 2020. We need to stop letting political parties divide us as a nation. There is too much division in America. White against black, rich against the poor, men against women. Part of Dr. King's vision would be for all of us to get along and work together. Let's use the symphony as our devil and truly embrace the unique instruments that create a harmony. We must do it one home at a time, one community at a time, and one day at a time. There is only one race, the human race. Today, my vision for America 2020 is still the same. Let freedom ring in love as one great nation. And that is our question of the day. How did you mark Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day? Um, how did you mark it? For me, I think every time this holiday comes around, I think it's important to sort of reread the letter from the Birmingham jail, mm, another very that. profound piece of work, so I love that. The I Have a Dream speech is obviously the go-to for a lot of people and for good reason as well. And when you hear the children talk about MLK's dream, the yes. legacy there, remembering him, it is incredible. So tell us what you think in the comments or tweet us at ABC News Live. We want to know how you mark this day. And also, how did you make it a day on, not a day off? <laughs> Coming up, the gun rights rally in Virginia. Thousands of heavily armed activists descend on the state capitol after the governor declared a state of emergency, but the gathering was largely peaceful. We'll take you there after this. Hey there and welcome back. At least four people have now died from that new coronavirus in China. With many Chinese traveling for the Lunar New Year holiday, other countries are worried they may soon see the disease. Let's go across the pond now to our foreign correspondent, Julia McFarlane, in the London Bureau for more. Good morning, Julia. Morning, Kenneth. Morning, Kimberly. Yeah, so just quickly, we are expecting a press conference with the Centers for Disease Control um, at some point today. Uh, we're also uh, going to be expecting the World Health Organization to be meeting tomorrow in Switzerland, in Geneva. Remember, world leaders um, are already in Switzerland for the Davos Economic uh, Summit at the moment. Now, as you say, the latest is that at least four people have now died from this virus. There are now uh, more than 200 cases um, of this suspected across major cities in China, including Beijing and Shanghai. At least 15 medical staff uh, in China have contracted the virus. But most importantly and most significantly, I think, um, at the moment is that the Chinese authorities have confirmed that they have cases of human to human transmission. Now, that is significant because once the virus is able to spread that way and not just from uh, diseased or infected animals to humans. If it goes from human
human to human, that means that the virus is able to spread far more rapidly. And remember, with um, such increased um, mobility and travel, there are fears that it could be uh, a threat, more possibly an international uh, health issue. Uh, that is something that the World Health Organization are going to be looking into. They're going to decide whether to declare this a pub an international public health threat um, and what measures should be taken. Now, on that, a number of international ports have stepped up screening. We've got screening um, first starting in Hong Kong and Singapore, but that has now opened. Uh, Australia, Taiwan, Japan are all uh, screening on their ports of entry and in the U.S., L.A., New York and uh, San Francisco have started screening at their airports. Now, another story uh, I want to bring across to you that we're looking at here on the, uh, the foreign desk at the moment is hundreds of Central American migrants are at the moment stranded just outside the southern Mexican border with Guatemala. Now, hundreds of people have traveled, most of them up from Honduras. Now, they're being blocked from crossing into Mexico from lines of around of hundreds of Mexican National Guards. They have formed a barrier to keep them out. Now, a lot of these migrants are stranded in an area, and it looks like there is no humanitarian aid that's going to be arriving to help them out anytime soon. That's a difference between um, the, the lines of caravans previously around 2018 uh, and, uh, and last year. Now, what's happened recently is that the U.S. and Mexico, they reached a deal last year on tougher controls of immigration. Uh, remember, uh, President Trump threatened to slap Mexico with import tax, uh, import tariffs if it did not step up its efforts against illegal immigration. Guys. All right. Our thanks to Julia McFarlane there in London. Back here at home, Richmond, Virginia braced for violence during a gun rights rally, but it ended peacefully. An estimated 22,000 people were there. Those who entered the state capitol grounds were unarmed. But many activists who stayed outside the designated rally zone were heavily armed and were protesting plans from Virginia's Democratic political leaders to pass new gun control legislation. ABC's Victor Okendo was there. Flags held high, AR-15s slung over their shoulders. These protesters say they're here to fight for the future of their country. Guns save lives. I mean, it's obvious. It's our God-given right to protect ourselves, our family. It's America, right? We live free. Virginia, the latest flashpoint in the gun debate sweeping the country. Virginia tightening security ahead of a protest defending the Second Amendment as it's under assault there. Monday's rally comes in response to three new gun control bills. Governor Ralph Blackface Northam downplaying Democrats' plans to strip people of their Second Amendment rights. More than 20,000 gun rights advocates descended on Richmond today for what used to be a small annual event, a state of emergency declared, the crowd protesting the state's efforts to overhaul gun laws. As Virginia goes, so does the rest of the nation. That's what I believe. The rally just got underway. An officer told me they expected about 10,000 people here inside on the Capitol grounds, but outside on the streets, there are thousands more. Last May in Virginia Beach, a gunman entered a municipal building and killed 12 people, sparking a renewed conversation around gun control. There's been a stark political shift. Democrats now in control. The legislature and the governorship have proposed sweeping gun control legislation requiring background checks on all firearm sales, cap handgun purchases at one per month, and let local governments ban weapons from certain locations. President Trump tweeting today that Democrats are working hard to take away your Second Amendment rights. This is just the beginning. Virginia currently has some of the weakest gun laws in the nation, according to the Giffords Law Center. The people showing up right here sends a message to Governor Northam and the Democrats that our rights shall not be infringed. These infringements are unconstitutional, so we're going to challenge them all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Geary family of six drove 100 miles to be here today. I value our constitutional rights and the right to bear arms, I think, is very important. And um, if I don't do it for them, then they can have those rights that I grew up with. Is that why you wanted to bring them out here with you today, to show them an example? I think, I think it's important for them to learn early that you need to take an active role in protecting your rights and, and voicing your opinion. Six-year-old Charlie just beginning to understand the lessons his father's teaching him. From families to those in costume invoking the founding fathers. So you're armed. What did you bring with you? Uh, this rifle is a Colt rifle. We see it? It's more than 60 years old. This rifle wasn't a problem 30 years ago. It wasn't a problem 20 years ago necessarily. Why is it a problem today? Today's protest was peaceful, but that's not what authorities were expecting. 
Last week, Governor Ralph Northam imposed a temporary weapons ban on the designated protest area around the Capitol building. We're seeing threats of violence. We're seeing threats of armed confrontation and assault on our Capitol. But rally goers still bore arms today, pouring out into the surrounding streets where weapons were not banned. Why did you want to be armed today? Um, I think it's important. Um, I carry all the time anyways, not you necessarily AR-15, but, you know, just to show that it is a right that we do have. I think all women should learn how to use a firearm and carry with them on a regular basis. Uh, it's a great feeling of protection. Throughout the crowd was a smattering of various fringe groups. Can I ask what that patch means? The one that says RWDS. Uh, you look it, up. it stands for Right Wing Death Squad an expression the Anti-Defamation League says is used by some on the extremist right. So it's open? Yeah, you can come in. Today's heightened security came in the wake of the arrest of seven suspected members of a fringe white supremacist group called The Base last week. The Base is a group that despises minorities um, and immigrants and will use violence to bring about what it sees as overthrowing the United States government. Uh, and everything that the U.S. stands for right now. In Maryland, authorities say three suspected members of the base were plotting to attend the Richmond rally with hopes of starting a racial war. In Georgia, the FBI says these three men allegedly had plans to overthrow the government while planning an attack on members of the left-wing group Antifa. And in Wisconsin, federal charges have been brought against a suspected member of the base for his alleged role vandalizing a synagogue. We have to be very careful not to tar a legitimate Second Amendment uh, protesters with the same brush as white supremacists. We have advocates for uh, for the Second Amendment that have nothing to do whatsoever, and that's the, the overwhelming majority. Today's protest brought with it the painful memories of another Virginia gathering. You will not replace us! Charlottesville, where in 2017, white supremacists and other far-right groups held one of their largest gatherings in a decade. And a vowed white supremacist killed a counter-protester, Heather Heyer, injuring dozens more. Law enforcement officials face scathing criticism for what many called a passive response. I think post-Charlottesville, uh, there was a lot of people in this country that were quite surprised at the sheer magnitude and numbers of individuals and groups who came out to support uh, the Unite the Right rally. Uh, and I think uh, there's a constant fear percolating just below the surface uh, of, of everyday Americans that were just around the corner from another incident like Charlottesville. Were you nervous at all coming out here today, given that there was a fear that there might be some white supremacist groups? They don't, no. They don't, one, they don't bother me. Two, I'm not afraid of anybody, to be honest. I got God in my guns, so yeah. I can't bring my guns in here, so I got God with me. Though the rally was overwhelmingly white, Devin Perkins believes that the fight for gun rights crosses racial lines. And you are against these new gun restrictions Completely now? Against them. Completely against them. I mean, look, look through history. We've had slave codes. We've had black codes. We've had Jim Crow. These were all laws that were implemented to keep black people from defending themselves in any kind of way. A few steps away inside the Capitol, this member of the Black Lives Matter movement feels very differently. With the threat of gun violence today from the armed militias out there, um, I'd rather call them terrorists because that's what they are to me. Um, it definitely has given me like a lot of flashbacks today to Charlottesville because I was one of the youngest counter protesters in Charlottesville. New Paul Kiazolu is part of the student led group March for Our Lives formed in the wake of the Parkland shooting. She and other students camped out in the Richmond Capitol building overnight to lobby for gun control. The other side is afraid and they realize this is a turning point and this is a turning point not just for Virginia politics but nationwide. What was your main goal then in coming here and spending your night in a government office? For all the legislators to see that young people are here, we care, and we are not apathetic when it comes to these issues. And for them to see, like, you know, these are your constituents, these are the people that care, these are the people that are showing up, and our voices should be heard and taken seriously. Voices from inside the Capitol and out. This debate over guns and the right to bear arms, as old as our country itself. For Nightline, I'm Victor Okendo in Richmond, Virginia. Our thanks to Victor there. And finally, here's what to watch out for today. The historic impeachment showdown kicks into high gear with a fight over ground rules. Democrats are crying foul over the plan that will push a vote on possible witnesses well into next week. Stay with ABC News as the historic impeachment trial unfolds. We'll have live team coverage streaming right here on ABC News Live. It all begins today at 12.30 p.m. Eastern.
And meanwhile, President Trump is in Davos, Switzerland, for the World Economic Forum, where he's scheduled to meet with the president of the European Commission, the president of Switzerland and the prime minister of Pakistan, before attending a dinner with CEOs from around the world. Well, that is it from us on this Tuesday morning. We hope you have a great day. Again, our coverage of the impeachment trial begins at 1230 right here on ABC News Live. Thanks for joining us.